I'm really happy to welcome back uh, Devin, Devin Borman here to Razmav Sar TV. Our last videos were really interesting and I would like to thank Devin and welcome him back to Razmav Sar TV. Hi, Devin. Oh, my pleasure to be here and I had a great time in those interviews and I'm looking forward to sharing more with you. Uh, thanks a, a lot. Many of our viewers sent me, I mean, we received, I really received lots of, lots of private messages. They really loved what you showed, the way you explained. And then they, of course, many of them, oh, ask Devin to show us techniques. And then that's the reason I <laughs> invited you back to the channel. And uh, guys, uh, gals, be happy that because Devin is not going to teach you some wonderful techniques. And I know I worked with Devin in Canada where he kindly invited me to one of his, uh, one of really great event. And now Devin is going to show you some techniques before he's going to explain some very interesting concept. I just give the floor to Devin. Okay, Devin, go ahead, please. Great. Yeah, so happy to, to be here. So we were talking a little bit about what would be interesting to show in these arts. And one thing you'd asked for and said that your viewers are interested in was to see uh, a bit of the diversity between the sword and two hands, the long sword, the sword and shield, the rapier, which are often quite distinct weapons to the European systems as well, which I think makes them quite interesting to martial artists from different backgrounds. And uh, one of the things I wanted to show was the commonality or the unification in the systems between them and the approach, certainly as I teach it now. Um, and so I'm going to show you some techniques where I'll show you a technique with the long sword, then I'll show you the same sequence. There's a combination of movements with the sword and shield and then with the rapier. And that will give us some, some room to see how these different weapons call on us to move in, in different ways because the tactical and mechanical situation is different. And I'm also going to be showing you three different strategic or combative uh, ideas. We have in the way that I share the system, um, we have three different um, core approaches, how we might approach an opponent based on the context of the situation. And they are the true fight, which is when I have more room to maneuver, uh, I'm really seeking to have control of my opponent's weapons at all time. And if at any point I lose control, I use a bit of receding in order to requ reacquire control before moving in. So in some ways it's very conservative, um, but it's very useful for any kind of uh, dueling or tournament fighting situation, or even a self-defense situation where you really have control of your environment. Um, the second is the deceptive fight. And this is where we use false attacks and false openings to kind of play by those first rules, but breaking them in a way that lures our opponent into error. And then the third is called the adaptive fight. And this is a way of uh, fighting where we have to move forward. So you can think often in self-defense, but also traditionally in battlefield situations um, and in certain types, again, certain types of opponents where often there's a pressure to continue moving forward. We don't have the capacity to reclaim space like we do in, you know, fighting in the octagon kind of thing where you've got all the time in the world. There's often a pressure to keep moving forward. And so I thought I'd show a little bit of that idea too. Excellent. So that's what I've got for you. Perfect. All right. So I thought I'd start with the sword in two hands, the long sword. And I have my sword dummy set up here. And perhaps sometime in the future, I can come back here with one of my partners and we can do, do that uh, hands-on. But this is a good way to at least can show people if they want to experiment a little bit at home, you can do this with something as simple as this sword dummy here. So the first idea I want to show is this true fight idea. And let me know if you want me to break down any part of it. I'll show this whole kind of sequence. So in the true fight, and I talked last time about there being wide play and narrow play. So I don't start, I don't start here in front of my opponent. I start here in front of my opponent. And so an important part of the action is being able to come into their distance. And my first beginning here is going to be to throw an attack with the goal of drawing their defense. So I'm farther away from them. I'm then going to clear their sword, make my own attack, which may be defended, parry that attack, return for a thrust, and then continue on. So I'll show that a little bit smoothly. So it's attack, clear, attack, thrust, enter to grab. So just breaking that down again, I attack to draw the crossing of their sword. I can't go through my dummy. I don't want to blow it up here. So I've attacked. I withdraw and clear because when somebody parries, I know where their sword is. So now I can clear the weapon and I enter for a renewed attack to the opponent. They parry this. And again, the rule of the true fight is that if they have control, I need to withdraw. So I withdraw and I reacquire control here in the crossing. 
I tack again with a thrust. As they parry, I use this to control the space and enter here to grapple. So I'll show that a little more intimately for you. So again, attacking, clearing their weapon, attacking again, controlling, thrusting. And here, if they parry again, I'm going to enter to make this envelopment, which I think is one of the most common weapon wrap-ups in martial arts in the world. So it's neat to show. Then I can strike here with the, the pommel end of the sword or strike with the edge. Okay, now I'm going to show that same idea with the sword and buckler. I know these are favorites of yours because we did a lot of sword and buckler together. So the same idea here with the sword and buckler, I can use the exact same beginning actions. So I'm going to attack, clear, attack again, control, strike. And here where that envelopment is just as relevant with the buckler as it is with the sword in two hands. I'm going to show that same action again. This is Joko Largo. There I actually succeeded <laughs> in readjusting my dummy. So again, one, oops, sorry, step through. One to draw the defense, clear, attack, control, thrust. This type of controlling movement is very common to the European system. So for here, so I'm using this first attack to draw out that defense, withdrawing to clear as I step back, entering again. Here, if I could just strike, I will. But if they make this defense, I'm going to use this little adjustment against the blade to reacquire leverage and strike a new thrust. If the opponent overcomes this one, because I'm so much closer, I'm going to yield in underneath. And here I'm just using the edge of my buckler to press against the weapon to have control. I could come over to seize using my hand as well. I find often just pressing the buckler, I still need my buckler to be in place because they may have a buckler. And I wanna make sure I protect myself from being struck by their buckler. Now things get a little bit more interesting, or meaning quite diverse when we pick up the rake here. So we're going to do, this one actually is maybe a little more common, common to what we've just done. It's more interesting when we pick up that, um, the, the weapon um, for the, the deceptive fight. So the rapier is a thrusting weapon, so I'm not starting with a cut. We can make cuts, and I will make a cut in here, but I'm going to start first with this attack from quite a distance. Again, my goal here is to draw their defense, then I'm going to Seek here to control the weapon as we did before. Again, keeping a long distance here, really profile on my body. There's my thrust. And if they overcome here, I will enter, but I'm gonna actually grab the blade instead. The razor is not razor sharp at its middle spot. And I'm gonna do an interesting disarm here, which is done this way. So again, thrust, yield control, thrust, recover thrust. Here, grip, oh, there's my disarm. So the disarm here, so I can't get quite as far away from all of you in this dimension, but in my thrust, I'm yielding here, but notice how I really keep my body strongly away with the rapier. I'm striking, coming to control, striking again on that lunge. So I yield under because we're so much farther away, I can't get to the hand. So I'm going to grip the blade. Then I'm going to come around here. I could strike the leg here, but I'm going to come around because here they're holding their, their sword like this or like this. And so I conduct the disarm now using my weapon, either here ripping with the forte, the strong of the weapon by the hilt against the hand or coming upward if they're holding the, their weapons here. And I'll strip the weapon straight out from above or again, this way to strip the weapon from the hand. One thing always that has to be, uh, we have to be cautious about in rapier fencing is that the hilt can trap the hand a lot more easily. 
This isn't an issue for actually disarming people, but it is a, an important thing when we're working with our partners that we don't break their fingers. So often when we're practicing this and people want to experiment, I recommend if you've got a rape, you just to hold it in a simple grip like this, it makes it a little easier for the disarm to come out safely. So those three techniques were essentially variations of the same action across all three weapons. So the idea of using an initial attack to draw a defense, to give us control of the opponent's weapon now that it's extended, making a new attack, and then taking a moment to enter, which is not always our goal, but it's something that can occur, um, to enter and look at how we do disarms across each of those weapons, even down to the rapier where we're much farther away. And so we're using the weapon, the rapier itself, to assist with the disarm. This is really magnificent. I really loved it. You know, one concept applied to three different sets of weapons. Very interesting, yes. Very right, interesting. So I can dive into the next set if you want, if you, yes, or if you have any more questions. Absolutely. Okay, so let's take a look at the same, same idea. I talked about the deceptive fight. So the deceptive fight is uh, the idea of using false attacks, false openings, to create opportunities against the opponent. So let's start with the rapier because I have it in my hand. The idea that I'm going to take against the opponent is going to start with this initial first attack again. So instead here of making a fully committed, uh, making a more committed attack and yielding from their defense, I'm going to make a feint. So just by extending my upper body, it's this, the beginning of the attack looks the same. So I'm going to feint and I'm going to use that to set up a cut to the legs. Now, most people can evade that cut to the legs, but I'm gonna use this also to come around their sword and be striking here with a voiding attack. So this reaches around the weapon. You can see that the, the body positions of the rapier are really tailored to get in behind the weapon. Uh, so it's a really athletic form. So think, cut, strike. And I can show that here. So here's my feint, and I wouldn't even allow the parry to make contact. Cut to the leg, and notice I'm really, before I was here, now I'm really coming underneath where their weapon might be. And now I'm gonna come up into this line and I'm coming very purposefully with my hand over here, so that even as they chase to defend, I can reach around their defense to strike while keeping myself low on this side. Now it exit in this way. So I'll show it one more time and then I'll pick up the other weapons. So again, feint, cut, strike. And just one question, would it eat, uh, expose your arm to a counter attack when you go down like that? Right, it's a really great question. Part of it has to do with the nature of the weapon. The rapier is very, because of its, it's fairly, it's not light, light, but it is, its weight and balance are really tuned towards making it this long thrusting weapon. For me to cut with it in an effective manner, I really need to move through quite an extreme arc. So when I'm in proximal distance, this weapon touching my arm, even if the person decided to hit with some intent, even bare, you know, like wearing a t-shirt as I am now, this would not do very much damage. And especially if I was wearing a coat, which is typical for a dueling environment, um, that just would no, do no damage to my arm at all. Um, so even making that contact is totally, totally fine. Um, and especially if the person at that time is is thrusting or making contact with the weapon, it's even more likely that they're going to end up against the hilt of the sword. Yeah. Now, of course, this is the real risk. What if they then turn to cut my face? And that's why I want to make sure that I strike and then immediately evade on this side. I really am requiring, I'm protecting myself through timing. So ensuring that the opponent is chasing me in the defense. And I'm also protecting myself through mm -hmm this void position. The reason I'm there not simply here is to actually protect myself from the return of their, their attack. So by being here, I'm able to, it's very common for people to make a parry and then strike out this way. So 
So it's much harder if I'm voiding beneath that space for them to strike me easily. I mean, and there's lots of movements like that in rapier where we move around the opponent's weapon, or even sometimes they use the same ideas to still come into opposition, but change the angle with these contortions of the body we call gerate or, or twists. So you can see that here, the same ideas, but used on the other side of the weapon. So I take the same concept and we can take a look at it with uh, sword and buckler. So I'm gonna start from a cut this time and we're gonna see the same idea of attacking to the opponent's inside, to their leg, then drawing a defense and coming around their weapon. So here I'm making an initial feint and instead of making, this is what the real attack looks like, so that full step, I'm shortening the step and I'm casting the weapon into this circle we call Molinello. Then I'm lifting high as if I'm gonna cut this downward blow from the left. So I'm drawing the opponent to bring their weapons high. Then I drop into the leg instead. It's very difficult to read this change, ha, my ceiling. Um, so I'm gonna strike to the leg, reprojecting the buckler into that space. Now here it's very common that people either parry the leg or slip the leg away. So as I draw that slip, I'm gonna come back up into the high line. And as they parry here, I'm gonna yield around the parry and protect myself against this cutting weapon by oppressing the hand. Take a look at that here. So again, fainting, cutting to the leg, coming into the high line, and then slipping around. So here as they're falling into this parry and yielding around onto the false edge of the sword, and I'm gonna press their hand while I strike. So this essentially pushes their weapon against the inside edge in the hilt of my sword as I strike around. And then as before, I can end, exit in this way. So that's to answer that question again. With this weapon, a little bit shorter, a little heavier, how do I keep myself safe with that buckler? Now, with the longsword, different kind of play here. So we're gonna do the same action, but you'll see with the two hands in the weapon, the angles change slightly. So here's another yielding action. So again, I'm going through feint and attack into that Molinello, rising high, cutting to the leg on that diagonal. Whether I hit the leg or not, I'm gonna continue through. Here, this protects me, but as I feel their defense, I'm gonna yield around it, and it's easier. I could yield around it this way and strike here with it against the cross, but I thought I'd show something more interesting from in the tradition, and that's to, as they parry here, to yield and then place my body close to the weapon. This again protects me from its cutting power as I strike around it. Now I have the weapon held half sword so I can use it in this shorter, tighter wrestling space. Yeah. So here again, faint, cut to the leg. And there again, using the proximity to the weapon to protect me against it as I come around with something called a false point. So now I shorten the sword and I can work in this tighter space with the weapon half sorting. Now this is something that's done in armor often. So it's part of the armored fighting tradition, but it is also done unarmored um, when I need to, when I feel that I really need to press past, maybe this person's a very chaotic person um, or there's somebody that I feel like my advantage is more in this closer play. And this is a way to give me a wrestling advantage because I'm fighting with a knife instead of um, just with my body. So there's those three ideas within the deceptive fight. So before we go ahead, just for our viewers, tell us again the um, true uh, attack, as you said, right? And deceptive yeah. one. Just yeah. tell us again, what's the difference between the two? Sure. So in the true fight, my, my rule is when I have control of the center, so that's of their weapon or of the offensive space between us, that's when I have the priority to move forward. 
So in my first action that we did, I came out, there's no weapon in the space. I attacked into the space and the opponent parried me. So now, because I've been fully parried, I exited to give myself more time. But while I did that, I clear the weapon. So now that I, again, have cleared the space, I'm in control of that space because the opponent's being sent away. So I enter again, following the true fight rule. They, if they parried again, I could then control the space with the other side of the weapon, with the hilt of the sword. And that's how we ended up in those final actions. Yeah. Um, we also, I think, actually, we used another thing there, which was even if they parry one way, I might reclaim control. It's just to change the relationship in the bind of the swords. And a tremendous amount of work in the European tradition, and particularly in Duello Armazade, is, uh, is working on this feeling control of the weapon being able to retake control while in this press of swords. So there's a lot of interplay in this type of press. And so if they were to come again, I might come underneath to control or over top, but always seeking to have this advantageous relationship between the weapons. Uh, and in the true fight, anytime that I lose that relationship, I need to recover by giving myself a little bit of distance between me and the opponent to buy time. And I use that to regain control before re-entering. So whereas in the deceptive fight actions, uh, my goal was, again, thinking kind of the same way, maybe they're holding their sword, sword on the right shoulder as I was, I make the first attack. And so originally, I attacked with this full pass was a more committed action. If they didn't parry, they'd be struck. Whereas in the deceptive fight, I begin in this way. As they come to parry, I don't even allow them contact. So I'm actually already coming to this side while they're still chasing the first attack. So now as they're coming back to meet the second one, I actually come underneath it to a different target than expected. And again, now I'm still following kind of a rule of the true fight. In the deceptive fight, I would never like come forward without some sort of cover. I need to be in charge of, uh, we call this in Italian fencing, obedience. I need my opponent to be responding to me in obedience to me. And so I'm drawing them into this response and that's what sets up this yield. Okay, so each, I'm getting them chasing. And of course, if an opponent is unpredictable and chaotic, I use the true fight only. I don't, the, the deceptive fighting is really based on drawing predictable responses from the opponent. If somebody is truly unpredictable, I don't want to put myself into a space where I almost aid them in being more surprising. I think that there's a, in, I see this show up in, in lots of different types of fighting approach. There's a certain kind of novice student who thinks I'll be kind of chaotic and weird and random. And then my opponent will never know what's coming. But the problem is, is when you're chaotic and weird and random, you never know how your opponent's going to react. So it becomes almost impossible to build any kind of strategy against them because you're introducing the chaos. And so we only want to introduce deception when we recognize there's some kind of orthodoxy on the opponent's side. Now, it might not be good. They might, the opponent might not be smart. But the opponent should, at the very least, when you attack them, wanting to be protecting themselves. If the opponent's suicidal, making a, a, a false attack towards them might be a bad idea, uh, unless you're planning on their suicidal approach. <laughs> yeah. um, so generally, if somebody's very chaotic, we will use the true fight idea, which is generally to draw them into positions where we can fully close them out. So then we're keeping them, them shut out. So even as the opponent tries to scramble out of the space, and this is based on physics, not based on agreement. So they can't push through my sword here. They need to go around. As they go around, however they choose to do it, I'm gonna shut them down further and get into a tighter space where they can't easily escape. Or I'm of course, at the same time, drawing them to maybe attack to the predictable line. When we're here, they really only have one good option and that's to strike on this side. And so I can predict that very easily. So as they come around, I can use that moment to shut them down and strike or even, you know, if they're chaotic and somebody I like, I could cut to their hands instead as they come around. Also a good way to start. Excellent. Okay. And the third way. So the third way is called the adaptive fight. It's a little harder for me to show without uh, a person on the other side of it, but I'll show just the basic feeling of it. So in the third idea, and we've seen a little bit of these concepts within the, the true fight example I gave, but in the third way, it doesn't matter how my opponent responds to me in the crossing. I'm going to continue forward no matter what. 
So in the third way, I'm coming out, adapting, yielding. If they come to the other side again, then I might control here and envelop and control on this side. So the idea again is that I'm coming forward. They initially control me. As they start to make that, I keep in control. If they control again, I yield. Okay, if they seek to control me again on this side, you know, perhaps they raise up, I might yield again. And so here I did that same envelopment coming in under the arm, but I'm just gonna continue forward no matter what through the action. It's a little, little harder to show without a person giving all those sides. But the idea again being, I come in, they're pressing, I come over, they press again, I yield again. If they come, if they try to press against my arms here, I have them. But if they come over, I might yield under and then choose again to control into this tight space. This is also where we get into much closer grapples. There's also interesting actions in there where I might choose off the top here to control their blade, either with the pommel of my sword or even with both hands to oppress or come in between the hands here to pull the hands forward. Okay, striking with two hands on the blade or, or one hand on the blade, one hand on the handle. So that's the adaptive fight is this, they are, the adaptive fight is this constant pressure forward. And so we can see that concept. In the sword and buckler, that same thing might play out thinking of you really using the two of them as weapons. So as I'm coming through here, as I come, uh, perhaps actually I'll do it slightly differently. As I come through here, I might yield and strike at the rim of the buckler. Uh, if they seek to come across to parry that, then again, I'm going to be entering underneath, still pressing my advantage. So I'm going to, there's going to be a little bit more of this feeling of yield, strike with the buckler, enter with the sword, strike with the buckler, enter with the sword. So this, again, this constant pressure forward through the action. So in, if at any point if we tie, so we end up in a, um, a true bind of the swords. So over here, if we end up in a spot where I'm pressing and they're pressing, interesting things can happen in this space. One of them is I can simply let them go. So I, there's pressure here. I can let the opponent go and use that to enter. But we also, even with sword and buckler, do things like, okay? So I, I wouldn't typically, I don't want to come out and seek to grab, especially a cutting sword, unless I have a real security about it being at rest. And one way that it can come to rest is especially when I'm adaptively approaching, when the opponent here presses in and there's this freeze as the two weapons come into contact, then I can make that grip. And here I'm just grabbing it against the handle. So you can see if I turn here, it's using the heel of my hand against the blade. So I'm coming against the flat of the blade. I'm not grabbing the edges of the blade. Uh, and again, typically with a gloved hand, the weapon is not a razor blade because it needs to have some durability in combat. So there is, especially if I'm not grabbing right at the point, but grabbing here a little further down, you can grab them with a lot of security. Now, finally with the rapier, the adaptive fight, I need a lot more room for the, <laughs> the rapier's adaptive fight. Um, but there's a lot of different interesting ideas that come within the tradition for proceeding forward. Um, so some of them can be just as simple as approaching, controlling, maintaining control, entering, yielding, et cetera. Some of them are a little bit more uh, interesting in that they can involve approaching in ways like this. Yeah. Okay, or coming here. Yeah. And so the concept here, and as we proceed, is with this long weapon, I might deny the ability of my opponent to seek control of it. Then as they either, they come to control me under the weapon, I'm allowing myself to get a lot closer to them. And so if the opponent seeks to come here, then I can simply close them out. Yeah. And if the opponent rests in that line, I can strike through that space. And then here again, my goal in all of these is to draw the opponent into action, so that I can come around. And typically the reason I sometimes will be doing these refusals, even refusals that look like this with the rapier is I want to really fully maximize the leverage so that I don't ever have to yield with the weapon because the weapon is so much longer 
um, then, well, maybe not longer than necessarily a long sword, but I only have one hand on it. I don't, this type of rotation takes a lot of time. And so I often want to, in these ideas, I want to approach as close as I can so that I can immediately connect the strong of the weapon with the opponent's weak, but always with this continual press forward without any pauses. So it takes um, to be proceeding in this way where I'm just constantly moving forward with no arrest to my movement is a different way of looking at the moments or the opportunities in combat as opposed to seeing them as these moments between movement and stillness. Now it's about finding these little adjustment moments on the part of my opponent and putting myself in between them.